Hey guys, this is Joe Harper with Reform Truther and Ministries. The topic of today's video is the ideology of communism. Now, communism is an important topic to study because it is a belief system that has truly marched across the world in modern times and has uh, a power and influence over the world that is not even realized by many people. And another reason why communism is an important topic to talk about is because it is one of the most important tools in the arsenal of those who are perpetuating the New World Order conspiracy. Those who are a part of the secret societies and the globalist elite groups have used communism for their purposes and it is a very important piece of the puzzle, as it were, in understanding this conspiracy to bring the entire world together under one government. So I'm going to spend much of this video discussing the history of communism and its advance, but it may be helpful to start out by giving a definition of what communism is. And the definition that I have come up with is that communism is a collectivist ideology that calls for the elimination of private prop property and private ownership for the alleged purpose of creating an equal society. So as I've said, communism desires to eliminate private property and private ownership with the idea, with the so-called stated goal of creating a completely equal society where everything is owned equally amongst everybody in the society. This is a utopian scheme um, for the world. And another ideology that comes up and is often talked about alongside communism is that of socialism. Now, it must be understood that the term socialism is at times used interchangeably by certain people with communism, and then by other people it is often tried to be defined in a manner that makes it very distinct from communism. And in order to understand this, this source of potential confusion, it must be recognized that there are multiple forms of socialism that have varying degrees of differences from each other. But for lack of a better definition, it can easily be said that socialism is a system, a belief system that calls for the redis redistribution of wealth. So it's important for us to understand that there are multiple forms of socialism, but the goal of true socialism is always for the working towards of communism. And this is even what Vladimir Lenin said, that the true goal of socialism is communism. And this has always been the case. Now, it has to be understood that, that communism has never been about economics. It has never been about equality. It has always been about control. And it is such a deceptive philosophy because it promises complete equality and equal wealth for everybody. And with this deceptive promise, it has been an incredibly effective means of enslaving and controlling entire nations and peoples. So it actually does the exact opposite of what it promises. It is the state taking everything that is owned by the individuals within a certain nation or country and then so-called alleging to give it back to the people when in fact they have had everything taken from them. And another important point to recognize is that communism is a completely anti-Christian philosophy. It is an anti-biblical philosophy. It completely goes against what is taught in the Bible and is taught in God's Word and in Scripture. And one has to look no farther than the Ten Commandments to see proof of this. For example, the Eighth Commandment says that thou shalt not steal. And the Tenth Commandment says that thou shalt not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, just these very concepts of not stealing what does not belong to us and not coveting that which does not belong to us entails that certain things are owned by certain people including property and wealth so these ideas of private ownership and private property are biblical concepts and it is of course in one sense it is certainly true to say that everything belongs to god but god has given certain things to individuals for their stewardship and he does not call for us to take which does not belong to us and to covet those who have more than us. And we see these concepts very clearly defined in the Ten Commandments, that thou shalt not steal and thou shalt not covet. And these very same commandments are completely violated and broken by the tenets and ideology of communism.
Now, it must be understood that in order to understand the true nature of communism, you have to understand where it has come from, you have to understand where it originates from, and who has created it and who has perpetuated it. And in order to understand the history of communism, it must be understood that communism was created by the Illuminati, which in turn is an organization which has been controlled by the Society of Jesus or the Jesuit Order. Now, I've made a full video on the Illuminati recently, so I am not going to go over all of the particular details and history of that group. But let me start by saying that Adam Weishaupt, who created the Bavarian Illuminati in 1776, and who was a Jesuit priest and a professor of canon law at the University of Ingolstadt, that he called for the creation of a one-world system that included a one-world government, a one-world religion, um, and he called for the elimination of private property and private ownership. Now, one may hear this and go, well, those sound exactly the same as the goals of communism, and that is because they are, in fact, the very same goals. One could properly say that communism has always been the outward ideology, the outward face of the more secretive inward Illuminati, and this will be seen as we move along in this video. So I'm going to spend most of this video covering the history of communism and talking about how it has progressed throughout the world and defining how it has been at work even up to modern times. Now, communism has been called at times Marxist-Leninism because of the influences of these two men, um, Karl Marx and Vladimir Lenin, in the development of the ideology of communism. Now, Karl Marx was a German philosopher who lived in the 19th century in Europe who was instrumental in developing the ideology of communism. His writings became a foundation for the socialist and communist movements in Europe at that time and he became one of the fathers of worldwide international communism. Through his writings um, have influenced countless individuals throughout the world in history since his life. He famously wrote the book called Das Kapital and alongside Friedrich Engels he wrote the Communist Manifesto in 1848, which was the political platform for the communist movement at that time. And when one reads the Communist Manifesto, you see that it is a, a political document, a, a manifesto as the name suggests, that was not calling truly for true equality when you look at what it was advocating, but it was advocating for control as I've already said, that it was advocating for control for those who would be in the positions of power. And a good example of this is one of the planks of the Communist Manifesto was calling for the creation of central banks. And you would say, well, that's an odd idea. When you understand that communism has always talked about um, the rich and the powerful, the bourgeoisie oppressing the workers or the proletariat, and you think, well, what good would it be to call for the creation of a central bank when you were supposed to be against capitalism and against banking? And it was that the idea that um, that the central bank would be a great means of consolidating financial and economic control as part of that plank of eliminating that private property and private ownership. And you see that that is a completely contradictory concept to the alleged goals and promises that communism has always stated to the masses. And you see that, in fact, the Communist Manifesto was a document working for the control of the elites of the Illuminati. Now, these ideas are not hard to understand when one understands that Karl Marx was working for the Illuminati because of the fact that he was a Luciferian who worshipped the devil. He was a Freemason, a part of the Masonic cult, and he was a member of the Illuminati. And in order to understand the, the history of Marx's belief-ism and the fact that he was a Luciferian who was infatuated with the devil, this has been well documented in the book Marx and Satan by Richard Wormbrand. Now Richard Wormbrand was a Lutheran pastor who lived 
behind the Iron Curtain when communism was at its zenith to power there. And he was, as a Christian pastor, was imprisoned and tortured by the communists in power in his country, which led him to write about communism. And his book, Marx and Satan, documents from Marx's own writings his adoration and elevation of Lucifer or of Satan. How he was infatuated with the devil and that he gave great praise and adoration to the devil and instead he he even though he had grown up in a home that had professed christ he turned away from that and he developed a great disgust and hatred for christianity so when you read and when you truly understand the life of karl marx you see the spiritual forces at work behind the ideology of communism and that has been true with all of the leaders of the communist movement when you understand the spiritual forces at work behind the leaders of communism such as Lenin or Stalin you can understand how such great evil has been perpetrated under this ideology that we know to be international communism now Marx, as I said, was a member of Freemasonry and of the Illuminati, and he worked um, for those movements to develop the ideology that bared his name of Marxism. And this can be dis demonstrated from history. For example, in 1864, Marx worked to establish a labor organization that became known as the First International. And this labor federation was an organization of workers with the trade unions of that time supporting it. And this organization espoused the beliefs and doctrines of Karl Marx. And in this role, Karl Marx worked with two men. The first man was Giuseppe Mazzini and the second man was Sir Lionel de Rothschild. Both of these men were key members of the Illuminati in their day. And... Giuseppe Mazzini, um, it is well documented that not only was he the main leader of the Illuminati in Europe after the death of Adam Weishaupt, but his ties to European Freemasonry and also the political organization, the Carbonari, was well documented at that time. And he was a part of the great independence movements in Europe that, that were rioting and calling for greater... Um, political changes. He was a part of the movement for Italian unification in Italy, and in his writings, he even called for the creation of a unified European state. So he was a key leader in the work of the Illuminati, and Sir Lionel de Rothschild was a member of the famous Rothschild banking family, which is even to this day still one of the richest families in the entire world, that with their connection to the worldwide international banking system they are incredibly wealthy and their family has been a part of the illuminati ever since its creation so they are well tied to the masonic movement and these men worked alongside karl marx for the de development of the ideology of communism now karl marx went on to continue to write out his works that espouse his philosophy throughout his life and then he died in 1883 but the the ideology of communism of socialism and communism continued to spread in europe throughout the the rest of the 19th century and into the 20th century and this brings us up to the days of world war one and the russian revolution and it must be understood was that the bolshevik revolution that broke out in 1917 and the creation of the Soviet Union that followed was one of the key events in the advancement of communism worldwide. Now, Vladimir Lenin, just as Karl Marx was, was a member of the Illuminati. And he went on to, he had been exiled from Russia at a time. But after the first Russian revolution, revolution that came before the Bolshevik Revolution, he was allowed to return to Russia and he was able to launch a coup d'etat where he was able to take power which led to the Russian Civil War and subsequently the creation of the Soviet Union. And Lenin as a member of the Illuminati was backed 
by wealthy and powerful people in the West who wanted his political goals to succeed. And this has been well documented by a historian and a writer by the name of Anthony Sutton, who wrote a book called Wall Street and the Bolshevik Revolution. And he documented in detail how members of Wall Street and members of the banking establishment and the industrialists in the West worked to help Lenin to take power. They, helped, they, were, they brought the Bolsheviks to power and established the communist state of the Soviet Union. The Russian Civil War was a bloody civil war that took place following Lenin's coup d'etat, which was the Bolshevik Revolution. And after that bloody civil war, Lenin was able to fully take power and he created the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, otherwise known as the Soviet Union. And then after that, Lenin died in 1924. And the next man who was able to succeed him and take power was Joseph Stalin. And Stalin ruled the Soviet Union as a dictator until his death in 1953. Now, the next step in the development of communism would be World War II. And in order to understand World War II, we must understand the separate form of socialism, which was National Socialism. And this rose up in Germany with the rise of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party in 1933. Now, the Nazi Party was officially called the Nationalist Socialist Workers Party. And it has to be understood that National Socialism is a dialectical opposition, a contrary form of socialism to communism. And Adolf Hitler was backed by the very same people in the West who had backed Lenin. Um, Anthony Sutton, the same famous researcher and historian, he wrote a second book called Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler. And he showed that the exact same people who funded Lenin's rise to power in Russia were the same people who funded and supported and backed Hitler's rise to power in Germany. Now, National Socialism and International Communism are two sides of the same coin. They are dialectically opposed to each other. And in order to understand this, you must understand the Hegelian dialectic, which has been a theory that has been used by the Illuminati throughout history, where they bring up one force or movement or power, a thesis, and then they bring up an opposing movement or an antithesis, and they bring the thesis and the antithesis together in conflict with one another and throughout that conflict you they will create a synthesis which will advance their goals for what they desire so the plan all along was to create communism then they created national socialism and the plan was always to slam them together for the advancement of their greater goals of advancing the globalist takeover of the new world order the, the slight differences between the two forms of socialism in the grand scheme of things were minor. They gave great rhetoric against each other, but they were two sides of the same coin. And one cannot truly understand World War II unless you see the fact that the Jesuits, the Illuminati, and the secret societies were at work behind both sides of the war. It doesn't mean that there were not those who were truly fighting against totalitarianism, such as those of the Western Allies. But even in the Western nations, such as Great British Empire or the United States, there were still people in the West in high levels of power who were working for the advancement of these globalist schemes. And the, as a result of these two ideologies being slammed together was the Second World War. And we know that the Nazis and the Soviet Union fought each other when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union in 1941. And the resulting of that war was that communism was triumphant alongside the Western allies over the Nazis and over the fascists and over the empire of Japan and the East. And the Soviet Union under Joseph Stalin was able to take over all of Eastern Europe. All of these countries such as Poland and Hungary and Romania and Bulgaria and Czechoslovakia and Albania and Yugoslavia and the eastern half of Germany all became communist overnight. And in the east, that the Soviets were able to take, take territory, such as the territory of Manchuria, from the Empire of Japan. And the result of this was that half of the world was now in the hands of the communists. 
and only four years later, the communists in China won the Chinese Civil War, and another a, another huge nation in Europe was now under the umbrella of communism. Communism had taken over half the world, and they were well on their way to march across the other half. And this set the stage for the conflict of the Cold War. Now, we have to understand that the Cold War was an ideological conflict, which, according to official history, raged between 1945 and 1991, even though in reality it never truly ended. And it must be understood that it was a true conflict between the East and the West, but it has been presented to us in a way that has been deceptive by mainstream historians, because the communists in the East were working for the takeover of the West, but the, the Western globalists in the West were the are the exact are the other side of the same coin. So once again, we see this idea. You know, we've been told that the West was totally fighting for freedom and for liberation from communism, which in one sense was true. But we also understand that the globalists in the West that backed the rise of Lenin and backed the rise of Hitler are the same Western globalist powers that are working for the New World Order, and they are no different from the communists that were working from Moscow or Beijing. And this is still true today, that the globalists, the Western globalists and the communists are two sides of the same coin. But we also understand in the Cold War that there were people working in the Western governments and in the Western militaries to truly try to fight communism and were truly trying to stop its spread throughout the world. But they were working within systems of control that were working against them. And this helps us to understand the true nature of the Cold War. Now, the communists, the international communist movement, and in addition, the Soviet Union, they realized that the West was too powerful militarily, politically, and economically to take over by violent force. They would use violent revolutions wherever they could, but they realized that in order to truly take down the West and bring about the worldwide communist government that they sought after, they were going to have to use the methods of infiltration from within, collapsing the system of the West of capitalism from within, and changing the culture to advocate for what the communists wanted. And this was the goal, this was the strategy that they adopted, which was to infiltrate the in institutions of the West, to change the culture from within, and get them to advocate for communism from within the Western countries themselves. This is known as cultural Marxism. And the communists were following the writings of an Italian communist from the 1930s known as Antonio Gramsci. And the writings of Antonio Gramsci really became the Bible for the worldwide communist movement, where he talked about changing the culture as a means of, an advocate, of advancing the communist agenda throughout the world. And the number one target in the West was always the United States of America because it was the most powerful country of all the Western countries that were still anti-communist. And they, so they planned to use cultural Marxism to advance their goals. And they saw that the greatest enemies to their plans was the belief systems of biblical Christianity and traditional morality. They realized that if they could collapse Christianity and morality in the West, then they could collapse freedom and individualism because you cannot maintain a society that is free where the individuals have liberties and freedoms without true morality and without the tenets that have been taught by Christianity. So this is what the communists plan to do. And when you see this, that this was the plan that they have pushed forward ever since the beginning of the Cold War. And when you look at the great movements that have taken place in the past so many decades in the United States, you look at the sexual revolution of the 1960s. We've seen how sexual immorality, fornication, adultery, pornography, all of this has been promoted in the United States and in the West, that, that communists have played a key part in promoting that. I mean, we see the homosexual movement, we see the feminist movement, we see the pro-abortion movement. In current times, we see the radical environmentalist movement. All of these have been tools that have been associated with the, the left, the political spectrum on the left, 
and that when you study all of those movements in recent decades, you see that communists have been at work behind the scenes pushing the goals of all of those movements in terms of attacking traditional morality and Christianity. And we've seen that there has been a conscious effort by communism to infiltrate all forms of professing Christianity, whether true biblical Christianity or other forms of professing Christianity which are not truly biblical. And the ideology that for decades was used to promote this was what has been known as liberation theology, which is a, a false gospel that has changed the gospel into a political message where essentially Christ came to this world not to save sinners from their sins, but to free the oppressed masses that are under the weight of oppression. And this political ideology was famously in the 1960s and 70s it began to rise up in the Catholic Church with the help of the Jesuit order and it really found its origins in South America where it began to rise up and from there it has spread throughout the world to other sections of the of the world such as the United States and other parts of the West and the modern day movement of the social justice movement that is now entering into evangelical churches is really the exact same Marxist ideology of liberation theology, even though the names have been changed and the terminology has been changed somewhat, it is the exact same thing that has been repackaged with a new format. And we see that the social justice movement is making it roads into more and more conservative sections of evangelical Christianity, and even though some men have taken strides to put walls up and stop the advance of it. We see the advance of this going on even in our own day. So all of this is ascribed to cultural Marxism. And this was the goal of the Soviets from the, for the, throughout the entirety of the Cold War. That from the 1950s onward, the Soviet Union fully adopted the strategy of infiltration and cultural Marxism. Every aspect of their government, the military, the KGB, all of their efforts were working behind these policies of cultural Marxism, that they wanted to lure the West into a state of deception and lower the defenses of the West so that their ideology would conquer from within. And there were a number of men who fled the communist bloc and warned us about this, these defectors from the West men such as Anatoly Galitsyn or Yan Segna or Yuri Bezmenov, these men fled from the Soviet Union or fled from other communist countries and they told us exactly what the communists were up to. But their warnings have largely been lost to history due to intentional efforts to suppress what they said and also through the ignorance and difference of many people in the West who have just not taken the time to truly take notice of what they have said. Now, Anatoly Galitsyn is perhaps the most famous defector of them all. He was a major in the KGB and one of the highest ranking defectors to ever flee to the West. And he was debriefed in the West by the head of counterintelligence for the CIA, James Jesus Angleton. Now, when one understands the history of James G Jesus Angleton, he has a dark history in his own right associated with the dark underbelly of the CIA um, and even the New World Order, but despite whatever um, evil he did in his own right, he did legitimately hear um, the truth about communism, and he heard it from the mouth of Anatoly Galitsyn. Now Galitsyn told, told the CIA of the, the true extent of the infiltration that had successfully been conducted by the communists in the East into the American government. He told that there would be efforts to discredit his testimony, which did later come to pass, that the, um, the East sent fake defectors to the West to discredit Galitsyn's testimony. And he warned about their strategy to infiltrate the West from within and to lure them in deception and Galitsyn went on to write two books he went on to write the book New Lies for Old and he went on to write a second book called The Perestroika Deception where he even accurately predicted the extent of the deception that came over the West at the hands of the communists 
And so this strategy of deception went on for decades and it finally reached its full culmination in 1991 when the Soviet, the, the fall of communism and the Soviet Union was faked as part of an intentional strategy to deceive the West. And this is exactly what Galitzin warned the CIA and the American government about. He even made predictions that this was going to come to pass in his book that he wrote. And everything that he said in great detail happened exactly as he warned. And we were, we were, we have been told to believe that the Soviet Union broke up into separate countries and that communism became, was transitioned into democratic states in Eastern Europe and Russia. And in fact, this was all a deception, that all the communists now presented themselves as social democrats when in fact they had never abandoned their communism at all. And the KGB, which was the strongest organization in the Soviet Union, never truly gave up its power, but it just continued to exercise it behind the scenes. And even in Russia today, Vladimir Putin, who is the president of that country, he worked as an officer in the KGB, and he never truly gave up his ties to the communist establishment. So even this this so-called conflict between the East and the West, it is just, once again, there is just so much deception there. But Russia never truly gave up its communism, and neither did the other nations in Eastern Europe. This was all part of the grand strategy to make the West believe that the Cold War was over, that the threat of communism was over, and this strategy has largely been greatly successful. And today there are more communists in the world than any other time in history, and communism has made great strides in infiltrating the United States and Western Europe. And it has continued to rule in many countries around the world. Now, just a quick overview of countries where communism is still ruling with power. Now, one of the most famous communist countries in the world, or perhaps the most infamous communist countries in the world, is North Korea, which was established after World War II by the Soviets. And after the bloody fight of the Korean War, it has still been ruled by the communist dictators of that country ever since the end of the Korean War in the 1950s. And as I already mentioned, that China went communist in 1949, and even though it has, it has made some openings in its economic system to allow for some free enterprise, it has never truly abandoned its communism and that the Chinese Communist Party has ruled there and is still the only party in power in that country. It is a one-party state, and the only co- the only party that is allowed to have power in the government is the Chinese Communist Party. Now, another nation that went communist during the Cold War was Cuba, which went which went um, communist at the end of the 1950s under Fidel Castro, and it is still communist even up to this very day. Now, after the end of the Vietnam War, Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia all went communist as a result of the communists winning the Vietnam War over the West. And Vietnam and Laos are still both officially communist countries to this very day. And in Africa, the nation of Zimbabwe, that Rhodesia, which was ruled by a white minority government, fought a long war against the communists who were trying to take power in that country. And when the Rhodesian government, under pressure from the West, collapsed and the white minority government was transitioned into the new state of Zimbabwe, that the communists were able to take power there in in 1980 under Robert Mugabe, who was a Jesuit-trained communist dictator. And as a result, when you read the history of Zimbabwe, um, ever since the trans of Robert Mugabe taking power, there was huge land redistribution in that country where, where the white farmers were their land was taken away and it was given to others under the hands of the communists. And in 1994, a very similar event happened in South Africa where the ANC, which took power under Nelson Mandela, was a party closely affiliated and connected to the South African Communist Party. And it was, in fact, a communist party in its own right. And that communism has been ruling in South Africa ever since the takeover there in 1994. And then when one looks to South America, the communists took power in Nicaragua in 1989, which led to the famous funding of the Contras under the Reagan administration to fight the communists there under a CIA government covert program. 
In more modern times, Venezuela has gone socialist or gone communist, and Hugo Chavez, who was the president there for many years, had a close relationship with Fidel Castro, and it has been to known to be an espoused socialist or communist with close connections to Cuba, communist Cuba. And many other nations could be said that we also know that in the West, communist organizations have achieved great success in gaining greater influence in the United States and Western Europe, and that communism has made great strides. So with all of this history, we see that communism is still a very powerful force in the world. It is a part of this greater agenda to perpetuate the forces of globalism, a global world government system, a world political system, and a new world order under the work of the secret society. So in closing, there are two main points that can be said. The first point is that we need to understand that communism is not the entirety of the conspiracy, but it is only one portion of it. It is an important part of it. It is a very key part of the conspiracy, but it is not the center of it. We need to understand that the true the true um, conspiracy is the New World Order and the secret societies. That communism is just the face of it. It is the outward shell of it, but it is not the center of the conspiracy. But that being said, the second point, which is similar but of a contrasting nature, is that we must understand that even though communism is not the entirety of the conspiracy, that we as Christians still need to oppose it and stand against it. We, and we must not give way to these unbiblical ideologies of socialism, social justice, and communism. And these are all differing variations of the same belief system. And that communism is a very dangerous force in the world. It has a dark spiritual history behind it. It has been connected to occultism and to the secret societies. And it is completely unbiblical. So we need to, as Christians, fight against communism. We need to fight against it as we are called to fight against all false belief systems and ideologies. And in order to understand the true warfare we're fighting, we need to understand that we are in a spiritual war. We are in a battle against evil. And the reason why things have changed so dramatically in the West and all throughout the world is because the devil is hard at work using all of these ideologies, these belief systems to perpetuate his end, which is to pull everybody away from God, to pull everybody away from Jesus Christ, to pull everybody away from the gospel and to pull everybody away from the Bible. And communism or cultural Marxism or the collapse of Christianity and traditional morality, these are all just tools and we need to understand that our our warfare is spiritual and that the only way to win this war over evil is for people by the grace of God to wake up to truly see what is going on in our day and to understand that we are in a spiritual war and the only way that we are going to win this war is with the power of God standing behind us as we humbly serve our God and King and that the victory is going to come from the power of the Holy Spirit overcoming the schemes of the devil. That we know that the power that we serve as Christians is greater than the power of the enemy. And that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and He will reign supreme over all His enemies, including the false belief system of communism. Now that being said, guys, as I always say, this is a massive topic. Study it. Study the system of communism. Study its beliefs. Study the history of it. Understand history. Line it up with what with the teaching of God's Word and of Scripture. And God's going to use that to grant greater discernment and greater effectiveness in fighting the war that we're fighting. So this being said, this is Joe Harper with Reform Truth or Ministries. God bless.